If you want to open your Bible up to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, that'll be our primary text this morning. I'm going to briefly reference another passage before we get there, but that'll be the main text. It's good to be here this morning. Do appreciate your presence and welcome all. Do we have some visiting and we're glad you are here. And I want to encourage everybody, take your Bible and think along with me for the next few moments. And we're going to be talking about the subject of don't be lost again. And 1 Corinthians 9 into 10 will be our text. I want to remind you of something we looked at last Sunday evening. We're talking in Jeremiah chapter 6. And he spoke of those who said, peace, peace. And Jeremiah said, when there is no peace. And he spoke of how they had healed slightly the hurt of my people. These false prophets who were proclaiming peace, what they did was give people a false sense of security. God was about to bring a severe judgment upon His Old Testament people. But you had these false prophets saying, oh no, it won't happen that way. There will be peace. But Jeremiah said, there really is no peace. I say that because I believe the doctrine that is very common around us. It goes by different names, the once saved, always saved, perseverance of the saints, the impossibility of apostasy. I believe in many ways it is like the false prophets who say peace when there is no peace. It gives people a false sense of security. I don't want to imply that everyone who believes that just lives a lax, careless life. But that doctrine can certainly lead to it. Lead to people believing, well, it doesn't matter what I do. I've been saved. I can't be lost again. And I believe 1 Corinthians 9, starting at verse 24, is as powerful a refutation as you'll find in one single passage. We're going to look at a few other passages. But think about the context of this just briefly. In the 8th chapter, he had begun to deal with a question that is a strange one to us, meats offered to idols. We don't deal with that question here. But in 1st century Corinth, pagan sacrifices were like Old Testament sacrifices. Most of them were not burned up completely on the altar. Most of the meat was kept and could be eaten. And some of it found its way into the marketplace. Well, there were those who believed that since there really weren't any false gods that were represented by the idols, hey, it's just a piece of meat. Others still saw it as meat offered to an idol and in the 8th chapter, what Paul primarily does is he says, you be sensitive to those who still think of this as idolatrous meat. And don't you encourage them in something that would wound their conscience. And in the ninth chapter, he begins it by saying, look, I'm asking you to forego eating this meat, but let's look at my example. I gave up the wages for the gospel. I gave up the right to marry. I have sacrificed. I want you to do the same. When he gets to the middle part of the 10th chapter, he's going to go in a very different direction. He's going to say to them, okay, there may not be false gods, but these, these sacrifices are really made to demons. And he said, you all better be more careful about how close you're coming to idolatry and your participation in it, your fellowship in it. The section we're looking at today is where he makes the transition from one to the other. He's not going to focus on meats offered to idols, but he's going to move from, let's be willing to give up liberties to saying, not only must I be thinking about 
Well, I want to sacrifice to benefit this fella. He said, I better see the danger that I face. Start with me at verse 24. It's a little longer reading than we sometimes do, but I think it's important that we see this section. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. I don't want this next statement to sound in any way condescending or insulting to someone. But if the doctrine of once saved, always saved is true, what in the world does this passage mean? Why is it there? If you can't fall away, what are, what are all these warnings about? In the 8th chapter, he had spoken of the fact that you be careful lest you cause your weak brother to perish. He said, the one for whom Christ died. Well, what does he mean, a weak brother perish? Die from eating this meat? Well, everybody, weak and strong, are going to perish one day physically. He has to be talking about spiritually. And then Paul says, I take this seriously because I do not want to become disqualified. Some translate this a castaway. I do not want to be rejected. Here is Paul having said, I've given all these things up. I've, I've sacrificed liberties. Then he said, but I know I need to stay on top of it or I could become disqualified. And then he turns to the Corinthians. And, you know, I, I've got up here, this is a modern satellite map of Egypt and the Red Sea and Sinai Peninsula. In the Old Testament, we don't hear it talk about them being baptized. Why would he make a comparison of their passing through the sea and the cloud as a baptism? Well, he's obviously wanting them to see the parallel to their experience that Israel, they had a baptism into Moses as you had a baptism into Christ. Acts 18.8, when they heard and believed, they were baptized. 
In the first chapter, he made it clear. He said, you weren't baptized in the name of Paul. And the obvious implication is you were baptized in the name of Christ. Well, what happened to these people? Oh, we know what happened to these people. God was not well pleased with them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. And what does he say? They became our examples. Look at, I don't know, one of the strangest things that I, I hear sometimes, well, it says, you're to take heed lest you fall. I want to get that before I move on to what to me is an oddity. He says, these were examples. What happened to Israel, baptized Israel, that didn't make it to their reward is an example for you. Let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. Some have said, but really what Paul is saying is, I have to stay on top of things or I'll no longer be qualified to be an apostle and be a preacher. And, you know, I won't get as great a reward in heaven. Is that what Paul is saying? Is, he, is that all he means in this whole section is, well, you know, I, I, I won't get as, in the language of some, as many stars in my crown. Really? He's used the word perish of that weak brother. Look at what he says in verses 7 and 8. And do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, I'm sorry, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day 23,000 fell. Now I'm picking out these two for a reason. He says, let's make sure we don't become idolaters. Let's make sure we don't become sexually immoral, as some of them did. Some of the baptized Israelites fell into those sins. You baptized Corinthians, you better not fall into these. What did he say in the 6th chapter, verses 9 and 10? Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. And he goes on, he said, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Chapter 10 is a clear warning that a Christian can become involved in idolatry. A Christian can become involved in sexual immorality. Does 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 say that the sexually immoral and the idolaters who are out in the world, they can't inherit the kingdom of God. But hey, if you're a Christian and you're sexually immoral, you're homosexual, you're a thief, you're covetous, then you'll still go to heaven. No, that's not what he says. Not at all. That we are to pay attention to this. Let me just ask you. Do we really see the Israelites? Is he saying here, you know, they didn't get Canaan, but they got Moab as consolation prize. You know, they didn't get to go into the land of Canaan, but, you know, no. Their bodies perished in the wilderness. They missed out entirely. He said, he's not talking at all about, okay, you, you miss out on the promised land, but God has something Almost as good for you. No, not at all. And what we have in this is just consistent with so many passages. Like Acts the 8th chapter. When a man named Simon has believed and been baptized, you remember that his greed gets the better of him and he wants to buy the power to lay hands on people and transfer the Holy Spirit. And Peter says to him in verse 20, Your money perished with you. Excuse me, your money perished with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, 
and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Now, if you were trying to describe somebody that is saved, that has the hope of heaven, would you use words like, your heart is not right with God, you are poisoned by bitterness, you are bound by iniquity, you are guilty of wickedness. This was a baptized believer. And these words are used of him. Clearly. He has done, as Galatians 5, 4 says, he has fallen from grace. In this letter to those who, by faith, had been baptized into Christ and put on Christ, become children of God. He says to some of them, verse 4, you have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. They'd come to God's grace, but now they were going to the law. And he said, you're fallen from grace. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, it describes some people whose faith was going to be, and I'm I'm looking at 26 through 31. But I want you to see a few things. In verse 28, he says, The man who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment? Now, what's a worse punishment than death without mercy? I mean, you know, this is not some physical judgment going to fall on somebody. Those who rejected Moses' law, they received the strongest of physical punishments. Death without mercy. How do you suppose he will, what kind of punishment do you suppose he will get who is thought wor- he will be thought worthy of who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I call to your attention the fact he said the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. This is someone set apart by the blood of Christ. This is talking about judgment on God's people who sin willfully, who they learn the truth. They come in obedience to the truth. But then they choose to live a life of sin. He said it's going to be a terrible fate for them. Another passage, James the fifth chapter, verse 19. Brethren, If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. I have read things that argue. Again, this was physical death you would save him from. In some limited exceptional cases, Turning somebody from their sin will postpone physical death, most certainly. Someone's destroying their life with drugs or alcohol. Someone's living a life of crime where they are, you know, breaking into houses and holding up people, you know, armed robbery and stuff. You know, their life's probably going to be pretty short. But is that what he's talking about? Those few cases, he just says, a man wanders from the truth. You save him from a spiritual death. One last passage along this line. In 2 Peter 2, in verse 20, he's warning about, verse 18, people who speak great swelling words of emptiness. They allure through the flesh those who have escaped. Verse 20 says, for if 
after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. People, the world pollutes you. These people come to know Jesus. They escape those pollutions. But he said they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened according to the true proverb. A dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Don't turn away. Don't turn back into sin. I'd offer to you that just as a sampling, there are a number of passages that talk about the hope we have and they put that little word if in there. In Colossians, the first chapter, verse 21, he says, And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. This reminds me of what Ron was talking about at the Lord's Supper. Remembering our terrible condition and in the grace of God that would intervene. He says, you once were alienated, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you, watch this, holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. Our being presented holy, blameless, and above reproach has conditions attached. That word if, you've got to continue in the faith. You've got to be grounded and steadfast. You can't be moved away. One last passage that shows this conditional. Hebrews, the third chapter. In verse 15. Or verse 5, rather. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Doesn't that if imply? If we don't do that, then we're not Christ's house. That we're only Christ's house as long as we do these things. And if you want to do a word search, look up the word if. And I will tell you, you know, right off the bat, the word if is going to occur a lot of times and some of them won't be pertinent to this subject. But you'll also find this is just a sampling of times that he has that if in there. And other conditions. God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son. But he attached conditions by which we would be saved. And he has conditions by which we continue to be saved. That, you know, 1 Corinthians 10, we don't become idolaters and fornicators and all of those things. That we remain steadfast. And we remain committed and, and on. Somebody says, but what about John 10, and I, I probably should say 27 through 29. Let's read those verses. They're in the scripture and I believe them. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given to them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. Somebody said, what about this? Doesn't this say that no one can snatch us from God's hand? And aren't, aren't we thankful for that? Aren't, aren't you know, countries, sometimes they're invaded by stronger powers. You know, at this point in history, you know, we feel like, you know, we're, we're as strong as any nation in the world. Yeah, maybe China, but yet China would know that to attack us would be, both sides would probably kill each other. You know, 
We don't fear that. But who knows what the future would hold? But spiritually, isn't it comforting to know that no one can snatch us? Yet who is he speaking of here? He's speaking of his sheep who hear his voice. Can a Christian quit listening to the voice of God? Can a Christian, as he says in 2 Peter 2, be allured through the flesh and start listening to the voices of this world? Of course. We've seen it. That's what the warning in 1 Corinthians 10 is about. Is those, the Israelites, who listened to God, who put the blood around the door, who ate the sacrifice of the Passover, they quit listening and they perished in the wilderness. We may quit listening. Somebody says that, well, you know, oh, Simon, you brought him up. He was never a true believer. He was just a pretender. Look at Acts 8 and pay careful attention to something in verses 12 and 13. Keeping in mind, this book is written 25 to 30 years after the, the incident occurred. When Luke writes the story of Simon, he knows how it's going to end. And he tells about the preaching of Philip in verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. Knowing what he knows 25 years later, what is Luke's inspired assessment of Simon? Simon himself also believed. He doesn't, that was a great opportunity to say that Simon pretended. He doesn't say that. He said he believed. What he says about Simon is no different than any of the other Samaritans. He believed and was baptized. But then the love of money and power got a hold of him. I want us to understand, falling from grace, being lost after being saved is a very real possibility. When somebody says differently, they're preaching peace when there is no peace. But can I offer some true peace to you? We don't have to fall from grace. God wants us to remain saved. And I want to give you four things that will help you. And then on the back of the, the items page, I've got these listed so you can remember them. You know, got the little short outline. There could be other things said, but number one is effort. What's the, why am I preaching this lesson today? So that you can get into a, you know, an argument at work tomorrow with one of your Baptist friends and say, you are wrong about that once saved, always saved, and I'm right about it. Well, if the subject ever comes up, I would like for us all to be better equipped to talk with people. But my point this morning is not so you can win some religious argument or that you can feel smugly superior to someone because... I understand the scriptures better than they do. My reason for preaching this is we don't want to fall victim to this. We don't want to be Simon. We don't want to be like the Israelites of old, like those of 2 Peter 2 or James 5 that wander from the truth. And what it takes is effort. Go back to 1 Corinthians 9. Everybody knows the story, at least some of it, of the Olympic Games that were played in Greece. And we today have our Olympics that trace themselves back to it. What a lot of people don't realize is near Corinth, Corinth was on, it's that little neck of land that connects northern Greece with southern Greece, Macedonia and Achaia, and it's one of those hard to pronounce words, the isthmus, you know, um, 
But there were these games known as the Isthmian games, I-S-T-H-M-I-A-N. Too many consonants in a row without a vowel makes it tough. You know, but those games were played on alternating years from the Olympic Games. And they included races. And they included boxing. And they included something that was comparable to our mixed martial arts. They had a, you know, they had wrestling. They had a fight. And, and this, I'll tell you, this has nothing to do with the lesson really, but it's just to, to show you the imagery. <laughs> You couldn't eye gouge and you couldn't bite. Those were the two rules. Everything else was allowed in these fights. I mean, that you could go for it. Well, Paul, I think in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, he's writing to people where these games are performed every couple or so years. They knew about the races. They knew about the boxing, the fights. And he says... I run in a serious way. I want to win this race. He said, I fight. I'm not beating the air. I'm landing punches. He wasn't literally fighting anyone. He said, I'm, I'm disciplining my body. But he said, I'm serious about this. You know, if you, <laughs> hey, if you were in a fight where the only rules were the guy can't eye gouge you or bite you, well, maybe you... You'd train pretty seriously, wouldn't you? We must put forth effort. Hebrews 12 uses the analogy of the race. And it talks about laying aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us, running with endurance. And the thing is, am I looking at my life and saying, you know, I could be lost. I need to make certain I put off any weights. A weight doesn't necessarily have to be a sin. But it can be something that is distracting me from running the way I should. And certainly, sin needs to be put away. In 2 Corinthians, I mean 2 Peter, the third chapter, he writes about being careful, verse 17, that you fall from your own steadfastness, being led away from the error of the wicked. See, there's a passage we could have used to show you can be led away. He said, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There are two choices here. I can run the risk of being led away, or I can be determined to grow. You know, I, I'm, I'm expected to be stronger, and I want to talk more about that tonight, growing healthier and stronger in the Lord. You know, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Am I concerned enough about the corruption of my life that I exercise wisdom in choosing my friends, my companions? 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, Pray without ceasing. The danger is always there. Jesus said to his disciples, Watch and pray that you not enter into temptation. How much are we doing of that? And we need not just effort, we need awareness. Go back to 1 Corinthians 10 and notice what he does in 6 through 10. Do not lust after evil things. Do not become idolaters. Let's not commit sexual immorality. Let's not tempt Christ. Let's not complain. He could have listed other things. I wondered why he listed those five. Were those five special dangers to the Corinthians? What I need to do in my life, and what you must do, is we need to be rid of all sin. But we all know that what faces one what is a danger to one person may not be so much of a danger to another. Something I've heard a lot about in recent years is football coaches talking about self-scouting. You know, most time when they, they're doing watching film and scouting, they're looking at other teams. 
They're trying to figure out what this team is going to do in certain situations. They're looking for a weakness in this team. But especially sometimes if a team has a bye week, they'll say, we watched a lot of our own film. We were self-scouting. We were trying to identify, you know, do we run the same play every time we line up in this formation? Are we tipping off our plays? Are we tipping our defense? You know, they're trying to find, what are our weaknesses? Well, how much self-scouting do we do? How much time do we spend looking at our life and say, are there areas of weakness that need to be corrected? Am I vulnerable here? Sometimes it's identifying areas of sin. Sometimes it's identifying areas that are going to end up in sin because I'm leaving you know, this unguarded. In 1 Corinthians 10, in verse 14, he says, flee from idolatry. Isn't he saying get out of some dangerous situations? The word flee, to run. He doesn't just say avoid it. He said run away. People have different temptations. But, you know, if somebody's tempted, alcohol is their temptation. And the friends say, you know, and they tell their friends, look, I'm, I'm not drinking anymore. And the friends say, why don't you go to the bar with us? You know, go to this party. You don't have to drink. Should you go? No. No. Stay away from places, people. That will tempt you. Maybe your temptation's in a different area. You know, toward immorality and fleshly lust. Well, there's television shows you just don't need to be watching. I mean, maybe anybody should be watching. But you, you know, you need to be especially careful. There are places you don't need to go. <laughs> maybe, you know, we don't talk about this one as much, but gossip. You know, talking about people. Sometimes the only way I, I can avoid gossip, talking about people in ways I shouldn't talk about people, is to stay away from certain people because that's what they like to do. And I have trouble not joining in sometimes. You know, so sometimes you, you've got to figure it out. You've got to be aware. If we're going to take heed lest we fall, and that's what he says, verse 12, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall, I need to know what makes me fall. I, I've told the story before about at the Centers for Disease Control, they have a, one division called the Accident Prevention. Or I don't know if that's the exact name of it, but it's something along that line, where they're not worried about you know, corona and you know, all, all these other things. That, you know, they, they are worried about accidents that injure people. And years ago, they had a director over it, a manager, whatever he was called. And he had put a jar in there. It was the party jar. You know, when it got full, they'd take it out and have a party. But if you used the word accident, you had to pay a fine. You had to put money in the... Now, his, he's running the accident prevention place. But he was trying to drive home to people the vast majority of what we call accidents aren't really accidents. He said somebody trips over a cord that's, you know, an extension cord that's run across the floor. He said, is that an accident or is that negligence? It shouldn't have been there. You know, you get electrocuted in your bathroom because you don't have the GFI, you know, sockets. He said, that's not an accident. That's something that should have been fixed. And he went on many examples. Sometimes we, we fall and we think, well, it was an accident. I, I, I had a stumble. And yes, there are true accidents. And there are times that we may just stumble. Something hits us unexpectedly. But I think there's a reality here that if we were more aware we saw the extension cord and we said, you yeah, know, maybe I should reroute that thing. You know, maybe I should, I've seen places, you know, they duct tape it down. 
You still got a little bump there, but it's not a loose cord that can grab you and throw you to the floor. You know. Be more aware. And then, and these two go together, humility. Arrogance leaves us vulnerable. How many times does the Bible warn about pride? Therefore, let him who thinks he stands. That man who's just, I could, couldn't happen to me. Yes, it could. Take heed lest he fall. You're a danger to others. That's what he said in the 8th chapter. But you're also a danger to yourself. If we become filled with pride, if we say we have no sin, not only are we deceiving ourselves, you know, he says in 1 John 1, 8, you know, truth's not in us. We leave ourselves vulnerable. I don't guard myself. You know, growing up where I did out, way out in the country, we, we rarely locked our doors. In fact, for many, many, many years, my parents just left the keys in the vehicles unlocked because, you know, it's a lot easier than having to hunt for your keys. They were already out in the vehicle. You know, would I leave my keys in my vehicle in my driveway today? Uh, no. Now, one, because when I reported the claim, Alpha would ask me, did you have the car locked? And when I said, no, I left the keys in the car in the driveway, they'd say, well, tough luck. You paid all these premiums. We're not paying, you know. We sometimes think it can't happen to us. It can happen to us. You know, we, we lock our doors. We take the keys inside. We need to do the same thing in our lives. And when we become arrogant, we also fail to rely on God. Look at verse 13. Isn't this a great close to the section? No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God will be there for you. God will keep you from being tempted beyond what you are able. Ephesians 6, we can be strong in the power of His might. Now, this way of escape is not some magical thing that is going to appear for folks who make no effort, who have no self-awareness, who have no humility about them. Sometimes the way of escape is to run. That's what he says in the very next verse. Flee from idolatry. One of the ways that God is keeping me from sin is by filling His Word with examples of people who didn't listen and what happened to them. By telling me about the Israelites who lusted after evil things, who committed idolatry, who committed sexual immorality, who tempted Christ, who were complainers. Why is He telling me all of that? In part, that's his way of saying, I don't want you to be lost. I want to help you. And so I'm sounding this warning for you. You know, it could come through the warnings of others. God didn't speak to me in some voice this week and say, preach this lesson. But I do believe God can use this lesson and maybe help you. Not just me, though. Elders, friends, Bible class teachers, family. You know, maybe somebody doesn't even like you. You know, they, they maybe warn you. God can use. Look at 1 Peter 5. This passage is a... It's almost an encapsulation of what we're talking about today. Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant. You know, be, you be watchful. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 
resist him. What means you can't do it. You can resist him. Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I, I would compare this in many ways to where he says pray for your daily bread. He expects us to do our part. But he also promises that he will provide. How does he provide? I don't always know. In this passage, he said, you be sober. You be vigilant. You resist. But then what does he say? God will perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle. God's got a part. One last passage along this as we close the lesson. In Jude, that would be the first chapter of Jude. Verse 20, but you beloved, building yourselves up, built you. This is your responsibility. Building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. You build yourselves up. Verse 24, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. I really want to encourage you all. I want to encourage myself to realize if I'll be sober, I'll be vigilant, I'll commit myself to building myself up, God will do His part. And His part, I believe, is often far greater than we realize. He will do far more than we can see. There is much we cannot see about God's working. Sometimes in hindsight we can see it. But trust in God. Rely upon Him as you do your part. Once saved, always saved. It's an appealing doctrine. But it's a false doctrine. It can produce carelessness. But I want you to realize, as 1 Peter 1 says, He has that inheritance for us reserved for us who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. If I'll supply the faith, God will supply the power. That inheritance can be ours. Let's live by faith in that. This morning, we've been talking about Christians who've fallen or could fall if you have fallen or you see the danger of falling and you just simply desire the prayers of the church, we'd be glad to help you. But if you're not a child of God, we want you to realize you can do this. He assures you you can do this. But you've got to make the decision to come to Jesus and be baptized into Christ. If we can help you come while we stand and sing together. Thank you for watching this video. We're glad that you have found our channel. And in fact, while you're here, we would encourage you to subscribe to the Jones Road Church of Christ channel. We have several videos already up. And we believe you'll find these to be true to God's word, helpful to you in your journey toward God. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you.